I'm amazed that on a Monday morning at 10 o'clock, uh, the ballroom here is so full. Uh, almost always so full. So thank you for coming. Uh, we had a little drama this morning. We couldn't get the screen down, uh, but you missed uh, most of that. Uh, I hope the rest of it uh, will work flawlessly. So, uh, the Weimar Republic, Germany between 1918 and 1933, creation, crisis, and collapse. Uh, you don't need to take photos or write things down. Uh, all of the slides are available, uh, and uh, you can email Ovid or myself. My email address is very simple, first name, last name, at gmail.com. Uh, and I would gladly make them available to you. Uh, let me start with a few uh, anecdotes. Oh, no, first uh, I will tell you how my uh, presentation is structured. I will tell you where the Weimar Republic fits in the German history. I'll, I'll let you know recent uh, discovery, and that is why uh, we call it the Weimar Republic. Uh, then we go into the five, uh, in to three phases, always about five years, the difficult start, uh, then the Roaring Twenties, in Germany we call it the Golden Twenties, and then the collapse of 1929 to 1933. So, uh, I was born in 1954, uh, nine years after World War II, and 21 years after the Weimar Republic ended, my parents, my father was born in 1927 and my mother in 1929, too young to give me a first-hand account of uh, that time. My very first public speaking uh, engagement in high school uh, was on the same topic, the Weimar Republic. <laughs> uh, I do remember I had one source of about eight pages. This time I'd probably uh, gone through 8,000 pages uh, to prepare for today. Uh, but that was my very first uh, public speaking engagement in high school. Uh, then in uh, 1978, the topic of my diploma thesis was the welfare cost of inflation, and I had to deal with uh, the infamous hyperinflation which was pivotal uh, in the Weimar Republic, more on that later. And then uh, Ovid last, was last year uh, suggested, after I, I had dealt with the Weimar Republic in Berlin just briefly, he said, uh, why don't you uh, talk about the Weimar Republic for a whole year? It's uh, an interesting enough uh, uh, topic. So uh, that's why we're here together today. So, where does the Weimar Republic fit in? Uh, this is probably the shortest uh, history of uh, Germany that you will ever hear. Uh, and, you know, this was called the Third Reich. Uh, so, what is the First and the Second Reich? Uh, the First in German Reich was basically uh, from 800 some call it 880. Uh, uh, we have to let Man Manuel know that uh, we still have problems uh, with the screen here. Okay. Uh, it was basically a thousand years and was ended by Napoleon uh, early in the 19th century. It was called, and this is the biggest misnomer in history, the Holy Roman Empire of German nation. It was not holy, it was not Roman, it was not an empire, and it was not German, and it was not a nation. Uh, maybe uh, someday uh, I'll uh, uh, talk about uh, that um, uh, 1,000 year period. The Second Reich was in 1871 when Bismarck, uh, unified the German uh, uh, country and it lasted, uh, what is this, 47 years? 
And then uh, after World War I, uh, the Weimar Republic started and ended 14, and a few month, 14 years and a few months later, and uh, then came the infamous uh, Nazi. So today we'll talk about uh, this period, and oh, so I have gone through this, uh, and I, one thing I need to tell you is this period uh, uh, from 1871, how Germany became uh, unified because it has a certain bearing on what we do uh, uh, discuss today. In the middle of uh, the 19th century, uh, the question of German uh, nationhood uh, was a, a big debate. And basically, the German language uh, speaking uh, people were Germany, which was Prussia uh, and uh, some other provinces, but the biggest other one uh, was Austria. At that time, Austria called the Austrian-Hungarian uh, Empire. And the problem was, it was a multi-ethnic, multicultural uh, realm, Austria-Hungary. Uh, there were people who spoke, uh, spoke uh, German, uh, Italian, Hungarian, Croatian, Serbian. Um, so how, if you combine Germany with Austria, what do you do with those uh, non-German language uh, uh, countries? And here is what happened. It was basically the House of Habsburg, Austria versus the House of Hohenzollern, which has ruled uh, Prussia for uh, centuries. There was the so-called uh, greater solution Gross Österreicher Lösung, which, which combined Germany with all of Austria, Hungary, parts of Italy here, and uh, uh, parts of the Balkan here. That was uh, one di uh, discussion. Uh, that was the uh, 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 greater Austrian solution under the leadership of um, Vienna. The greater German solution was combine only the German language uh, uh, countries, uh, Germany and Austria, but not Hungary and the rest of uh, the uh, Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Uh, and there you had the problem there, you had uh, Prussia and Vienna, uh, Austria, about equal strength and fighting for domination. What, what, what was uh, finally decided was the smaller German uh, solution, German unified uh, in the blue, and Austria, Hung Hungary was left out. Uh, so that was uh, at the outset, and those 47 years, the Second Reich, Germany looked pretty much like this. In uh, orange, you have uh, the dominant uh, dominance of Prussia, uh, and I will tell you, Berlin was then at the very center of this vast uh, German uh, country. Today it is very much uh, uh, close to the, uh, the, the Polish border, but uh, then it was at the very center. Prussia uh, was about 60% of the German population, and to the right, of this demarcation line, uh, people uh, were mostly Protestant, and to the left, in the southern German uh, provinces and the Rhineland here, uh, people were Catholic. And that is still the case today, but quite as stringently as then, but it's still uh, the case today. Uh, Prussia always uh, was viewed as uh, power hungry, as militaristic. So, uh, I, will, I have divided the roughly 15 years into uh, three phases of five years, the troubled beginning, the roaring twenties, and then the collapse or the demise and the rise of Nazism. Uh, the first five years saw the forced abdication of Kaiser Wilhelm. It became uh, thereafter the first uh, democracy. 
uh, what was difficult was to change uh, its economy from wartime to peacetime economy. We had the uh, Treaty of Versailles uh, in uh, 2019 and uh, the German hyperinflation of which uh, I have brought you some uh, examples over here and uh, I'm co uh, collecting uh, the hyperinflation type banknotes. Um, the middle uh, uh, period, 1924 to 1928, what is normally called in America the Roaring Twenties, were uh, marked by the absence of crises. Uh, it, uh, I uh, uh, hesitate to call it relative stability. Uh, you saw the rise of uh, radio, uh, even TV, film, uh, and Berlin quickly becomes the world capital for the creative arts. Uh, and it's also uh, five years or a little bit more than five years of um, decadence. Uh, Berlin becomes the capital of sin. Um, then Black Friday happens, 1920, was it 28 or 29? Um, the, the Great Depression in Germany was even worse than in America, more on that later. Uh, it is at that time that Hitler's party, the NSDAP, uh, becomes uh, a force in German politics and the demise of democratic institutions. More on this um, after I tell you why it is called the Weimar Republic. Have you ever asked yourself that question? <laughs> Well, you're not alone, uh, and uh, the term Weimar Republic became used basically after World War II. Historians didn't, didn't usually refer to that period as the Weimar Republic. Uh, what we learned in school was um, uh, the consensus of the historian was that uh, in late 2018, early 2019, there was revolutionary fervor in Berlin, and it was unsafe to hold a conventional uh, hold a convention uh, for the new um, constitution in Berlin. It was not safe for the politicians, and that's why they uh, congregated in uh, the city of Weimar. In 2017. This book was published. Where do I say that? Oh, here. The book, uh, Why Weimar, this is the book, uh, by a um, journalist historian uh, was published and it challenged the con conventional wisdom. So only in the last five years have we learned that the story was only half true or less than half true. Um, what really happened is, that uh, after World War I, the Catholic regions in Germany were pretty much against Prussia, and they were close to separating from Prussia. And uh, the first uh, um, German government uh, after the war decided not to hold the convention for the, the Constitutional Convention in Berlin as a concession to the Catholic areas of southern and western Germany. Uh, they chose Weimar, which is not part of um, uh, Prussia, it's in Saxony, and it's about equidistant, as you will see shortly, from Berlin and Munich uh, to extend an olive branch to the other regions and it also was the anti-Berlin, it had the mystique, there's a book on uh, the Weimar mystique, uh, uh, several hundred pages, uh, had the mystique uh, of uh, being the anti-Berlin, it was the Weimar of Goethe, of Schiller, and it represented the best of Germany versus uh, militaristic uh, Prussia. Here you can see there is Berlin, there is Munich, uh, and uh, Weimar was just outside and almost equidistant. 
that was uh, the, the reason why the um, Constitutional Convention was convened uh, in Weimar. Uh, this is uh, from the Chamber of Commerce today. Uh, in English, it's called the cultural heart of uh, Germany with uh, Goethe and Schiller. Both lived there, both worked there. This is the book that I just showed you. And this is what the Chamber of Commerce says. It's the historical epicenter of Germany's 18th century enlightenment. Weimar is an essential stop for anyone with a passion for the country's history. A pantheon of intellectual and creative uh, giants lived there. Goethe, Schiller, Bach, Cranach, Liszt, Nietzsche, Gropius, Herder, and the list goes on and on. So uh, it is a bucolic uh, little town, uh, and uh, trust me, it is the, uh, the polar opposite of uh, Berlin. So, end of World War II, we come now to uh, the first uh, five years of the Weimar Republic. This is Kaiser Wilhelm uh, II. He succeeded uh, Kaiser Wilhelm, his father, Kaiser Wilhelm I. Uh, he, in late uh, 2018, October, he uh, fled uh, Germany and went to uh, German army headquarters that were at that time uh, in Spa in Belgium. The American president had indicated that no peace negotiations would take place unless the Kaiser would uh, abdicate uh, and uh, uh, negotiations could be with uh, a, a more democratic government. Uh, even though he had no authorization to do, to do so, uh, the Reich Chancellor, Pr uh, Prince Max von Baden, on November 9, 2018, announced the Kaiser's, Kaiser's application in Berlin. The Kaiser uh, even went uh, fled further to neutral Netherlands. Uh, we come now to uh, a legend uh, that is uh, well known in Germany, but maybe not so well known uh, in the non-German uh, speaking uh, countries. It's called uh, the Goldstoß Legende up here, or uh, translated the stab in the back myth. And you cannot imagine how powerful uh, a myth or legend it was uh, uh, throughout the Weimar Republic and it eventually led, uh, helped uh, uh, lead to its demise. Uh, it, uh, from the summary of the book, stab in the back myth in its many manifestations had a profound and pernicious impact on the course of German's first uh, democracy. It went like this. Uh, it was basically invented by the German High Command by two uh, prominent features, uh, Ludendorff and Hindenburg. Um, it was intended to deflect the blame from the army uh, for Germany's defeat. Uh, it went like this. The German army was never defeated on the battlefield. Instead, it was stabbed in the back at home by unpatriotic elements especially the Jews and the Social Democrats. <laughs> As such, the stab in the back myth became the battle cry of all anti-republic elements of German society throughout the Weimar Republic. Hitler most effectively used the myth to his advantage. We uh, uh, moved to um, uh, 1919 and this is the treaty, the cover page of the Treaty of uh, Peace. It's uh, known as the Treaty of Versailles. It was signed in June of uh, uh, 1919 in this train wagon. Here are uh, the 440 articles. The first uh, 26 established the League of Nations. The remaining uh, 414 dealt with uh, uh, Germany and uh, its uh, penalties and uh, reparations. Uh, so if you hear the Treaty of Versailles, uh, it is uh, about uh, the League of Nations and uh, 
90% of it is uh, about how to deal with Germany after World War uh, One. Uh, in orange, these are the territories, German territories that were lost as a result of World War I. Uh, these uh, lighter orange are uh, further territorial losses after World War II. Uh, uh, this is now Germany as it is uh, today. The result of uh, World War I was for Germany, 2 million uh, dead soldiers, uh, 800,000 civilians died of uh, starvation. In addition, uh, 2.7 million uh, disabled veterans, 1.2 million orphans, and half a million widows. All of these here had to be taken care of by the new uh, state, and sometimes for 20, 30, 40 years to come. Uh, these were almost all under the age of 30, meaning that the new republic would have to take care of them for a very, very long time. Uh, the reaction to the Treaty of Germany, uh, uh, Versailles in Germany was uh, uh, pretty much uh, against it, uh, and uh, uh, the German uh, President, uh, where is he? Uh, Philip Scheidemann resigned uh, rather than sign the treaty uh, and exclaimed, Which hand would not shrivel that shackled itself uh, and us to, in such a way? Uh, so he, uh, he rather resigned than, than sign of it. To give you uh, a little uh, flavor of uh, the period of time, I've collected some of uh, the uh, political posters used in the first election. Uh, you had the right of center uh, party, uh, you had the social democrats, you have two, and um, uh, I'll translate this for you. Tear down the chains of capitalism, uh, elect uh, the social democrats. And uh, uh, finally, the communists. Uh, so that was uh, a typical uh, uh, election poster at, uh, in 2019. They all courted uh, the female vote because uh, women were, uh, were allowed for the very first time uh, to uh, vote uh, in uh, 1919. So you have the Social Democrats here, uh, the, the German Nationals right of center, uh, and this is uh, Hitler's uh, party at that time. So you get you get the idea. So we come uh, to uh, the next crisis, or the well, maybe the first very big crisis. Here is um, what a, uh, a ounce of gold did cost uh, from uh, 1919 uh, to four years uh, later. I don't even know how many zeros there are here. Uh, uh, it's a lot, and because I don't know, uh, I'll show you this. Uh, at the height of uh, the hyperinflation, it would cost you 460 billion marks uh, to buy a loaf of bread. I have brought you over here um, uh, some samples of my collection uh, of hyperinflation money. And I have a, a lot more here, so I took just uh, some out of them, and you're welcome to take a look at them. And I'll show you some. Uh, but uh, we have to go back uh, to, uh, if you want to know what caused this, we have to go back. Uh, most people uh, talk about the period of uh, 2021 to 2000, uh, 1921 to 1923, uh, but uh, really it started at the beginning of World War I. 
because uh, uh, Germany made a very crucial decision in order to pay for um, the war they decided to uh, uncouple uh, the German currency from gold because they knew they didn't have enough gold uh, to back up the currency they needed to print money that's basically uh, the beginning of the German hyperinflation <coughs> Also, uh, the German government, uh, in its delusion, thought that the war would only last for a few weeks, uh, months uh, at best. So uh, maybe they could go back to the gold standard uh, within a year or so. Instead, they opted for what we now call deficit financing. That was uh, what they did. They decoupled the currency from the gold standard in order to be able to uh, be unshackled from gold and to print as much money as they wanted. They were convinced they could repay uh, the uh, additional debt uh, when the expected short war ended in German victory and reparations could be ordered from the losing enemies. Uh, this was, of course, a huge miscalculation. The war lasted uh, much, much longer. Germany uh, uh, was not victorious. And four years later, Germany had not uh, only amassed huge war debts but, uh, debts, but had no means of repayment. Instead, reparations levied on Germany in the Treaty of Versailles severely aggravated uh, Germany's uh, debt suit situation manifold. Uh, there is a book out there that's called When Money Dies, it uses the German hyperinflation uh, to tell you the story. I have told you this uh, already. Uh, there's one other thing that uh, uh, bears mentioning. Uh, the first government was uh, led by Social Democrats and um, they had long campaigned uh, for the eight-hour work week that we still have today, uh, and they were the first one uh, in the industrialized world that instituted it. However, none of the other countries followed suit. So uh, you can imagine uh, that uh, the cost of production in Germany was higher than anywhere else. So uh, I cannot say, or I can say that uh, the German understanding of economics was not uh, what it should have been. Uh, more on that uh, in, in uh, due course. And then what happened that really brought the on uh, when we talk about German hyperinflation, we mean 19, late 1922 to 1923. What I told you was what uh, uh, started it. But uh, what really uh, uh, kick-started it into high gear was um, when Germany in 1922 fell behind in its reparations, uh, France uh, invaded uh, the German uh, coal and steel mining area, the Ruhrgebiet, and uh, uh, in order to get the coal and the steel uh, straight from the source. The German government uh, uh, asked the workers in that area for passive resistance, so they basically went on permanent strike, uh, but the German government had still to pay their uh, salaries and wages. So uh, you needed more money, and they just printed it and gave it to them. So this is uh, what happened. Uh, that uh, kick-started uh, the real hyperinflation. Uh, the winners of hyperinflation, there are winners and losers, they are not only losers. All of those who had their wealth or uh, their assets in hard assets, real estate, gold, foreign currency for instance, they won uh, during that time. All those who had debts and mortgages were huge winners of the hyperinflation because uh, their debt was worthless at the end of it. They had to could pay it back with you know a billion here. Uh, it was uh, easy. Uh, most entrepreneurs who had access to cheap uh, credit and the farmers 
who could produce their own uh, groceries. The losers, all who were on fixed income schedules, the pensioners, the welfare recipients, laborers, civil servants, all the middle class uh, savings, they were wiped out overnight, basically. The entire German middle class was financially wiped out. And this uh, did create further resentment towards um, the Weimar Republic, towards uh, Republican government. Weimar hyperinflation has left an indelible fear of inflation in all Germans, not just those who experienced it, but generations afterwards to this very day. You can still, uh, there's still people talking in Germany about uh, uh, Weimar hyperinflation. Okay, here are some of my examples. Um, on uh, November 1, 1920, this was uh, the uh, 100 mark uh, note. Uh, then uh, in uh, January, a little bit more than a year later, January uh, in 1922, they went to 10,000 German marks. And then, when they ran out of paper, <laughs> honestly, they ran out of paper. So what they did is they used uh, a 1922, December 1922, 1,000 German mark a note and just stamped over it 1 billion. <laughs> so uh, they ran literally out of money and that's how they created uh, a billion. Uh, then in uh, 1924, um, uh, there was uh, a reform of the currency, and this is the new uh, currency, and they went back to smaller denominations. And this is the 1924 version, and here is Hitler's version, the 1942, and there is a five uh, rice mark uh, version of 1942. Uh, I think I have them all. Uh, displayed over there. Uh, if you want to hear uh, uh, more about it, read this book by Adam Ferguson, When Money Dies. Uh, you can buy it on Amazon. Uh, it's available at the Kindle for $11. Uh, it is uh, written not for uh, economists, but uh, for non-economists, basically. My uh, hero in economics is Ludwig von Mises, uh, who should have received the Nobel Prize. Uh, he died in 1973, five years after uh, the Nobel Prize was instituted in economics. Uh, he, he, uh, he is of, uh, from the Austrian School of Economics, and he wrote, It is impossible for any foreigner even to realize how boundless this ignorance was. <laughs> the only secret of the German policy was Germany's total lack and acquaintance with economic theory. Uh, it's hard to understand that, uh, and you know, uh, a few decades later, in, uh, Milton Friedman, another a Nobel Prize winner, would say, Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, which is uh, good to memorize that because we live uh, in uh, um, a period of time where most people have forgotten the lessons of the 1970s. But anyway, uh, that was uh, hyperinflation. Uh, the important thing is the middle class was wiped out and resentment towards uh, um, a re Republican form of government uh, was uh, fueled. That, th th those first five years uh, uh, saw 350 and some politicians assassinated. For instance, uh, the foreign minister, uh, the finance minister, and famously, uh, the members of the Communist Party, Karl uh, uh, Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, and I think it was uh, 1919 as well. 
but there are only uh, four out of many. Here are the good and the bad politicians of the Weimar Republic. Uh, Friedrich Ebert, SPD, Stresemann, uh, he did not belong to any party. Uh, Scheidemann, the first chancellor, he is, he's the one who resigned over the Treaty of Versailles. I would say these are the good guys. Uh, then uh, this is Hindenburg, uh, he was uh, uh, head of the army uh, in, the second, in the First World War. Ludendorff, those two are the creators of the Dolchstoß, the staff in the bag legend, and infamously uh, Austrian-born uh, um, Adolf Hitler, uh, who uh, ended the Weimar Republic in 1933. We'll come to that. Uh, later. My attempted summary of the first five years, uh, Ebert, the new president, uh, made, made, and I haven't mentioned that yet, he made a pact with the devil when he left the military structure intact. He did not dismantle it. All the officers were kept uh, he needed the military to keep the peace in the streets, uh, in, in, especially in uh, Berlin. So that was a, a pact with the devil. Uh, the convention was moved to Weimar as an olive branch to uh, southern and uh, Germany and the Rhineland. The Treaty of Versailles with loss of areas in the east and heavy reparations. Um, the Francis uh, occupation of the Ruhrgebiet, hyperinflation destroyed the social structure. So it was not the best of start for uh, Germany's first uh, republic. But uh, it survived uh, and uh, it saw the Roaring Twenties, um, uh, a period of the absence of crises, relative stability, rise of the mass media, uh, Berlin becomes, uh, in last year, uh, let's talk about 100 years of Berlin, um, Berlin became the third largest uh, city by population behind New York and London in 1921, when it merged uh, outlying areas uh, into one uh, big uh, uh, city. Oh, I should mention, um, uh, as a result, uh, um, uh, the period of stability was largely financed by American loans, uh, loans through the Dawes plan. That is something that should haunt uh, Germany later. It saw the uh, emergence of mass media, uh, capital of the creative arts, the capital of sin and decadence, and unfortunately, the good guy, Friedrich Ebert, uh, uh, who was a consummate supporter of the government, dies in 1925, and he is faithfully succeeded by the old army chief, Paul, uh, Paul von Hindenburg. He was the supreme commander. He was an old school Prussian militarist who would eventually appoint Hitler eight years later to uh, the, the transfer. Uh, I've talked about uh, uh, the capital of Sin or the dance on the volcano. Here is uh, something that you might not even see today, but in 1925 or so, uh, that was uh, shown in Berlin. Uh, there is a book where this is from, uh, and that it uh, is worth to read that has been immortalized as the nastiest, wickedest, and most debauched uh, place on earth. Novels, plays, and films have told the story of the heroic Me Mecca and its descent into Nazi rule. This book here is the first book uh, to actually document the map uh, of the sexual metropolis, and I'll give you just a, a table of contents. City of Horrors, Berlin means boys, hot sisters. Uh, you wouldn't imagine that 100 years ago uh, we had uh, already in Germany. Um, uh, mass media and Americanization. 
uh, America all of a sudden was viewed in Germany as the land of unlimited uh, opportunities. As a result, we imported the shimmy, the Charleston, and jazz. Uh, Hollywood uh, started and uh, the creation of what we used to call the new woman, which had about this haircut. Uh, what is that called, that haircut? The bob. The bob, yes, very good. Um, innovation in the uh, creative arts, uh, you had expressionism, Dadaism, surrealism, new objectivism. Famous uh, uh, artists of that time were uh, Otto Dix, Max Beckmann, George Kroos, Kate Nikolovitz, uh, Gustav Klimt, who was Austrian but lived in uh, uh, Germany during that time, also Oskar Kokoschka and uh, Paul Klee, painter. The Bauhaus uh, uh, was created uh, in Weimar. That is, uh, Gropius was the founder and Mies van der Rohe, probably its most prominent uh, member. In music, Arnold Schoenberg, Alban Berg, Kurt Weil, uh, and Richard Strauss. In theater, Max Reinhardt uh, and Eugen Bertolt Friedrich Brecht, who you all know as Bert or Bertolt Brecht. He was really spelled with a TH, but uh, that's how you probably know him. Uh, and and Stoller in uh, literature, famous Germans, Döblin and uh, Erich Maria Remark, famous for his All Quiet on the Western Front. And importantly, the Thomas Mann and Heinrich Mann uh, uh, brothers. And uh, Thomas Mann, uh, let me go back. Sorry. Thomas Mann uh, um, received the uh, Nobel Prize for the Magic Mountain in 1929, I believe. Uh, in cinema, uh, he had movies like uh, The Cabinet of Dr. Cagliari, Nosferatu, Dr. Mabuse, Fritz Lang movie. Uh, and I think all of these moved uh, to uh, Hollywood at some point in time. And who does not know who that is? Uh, do you know where she is uh, resting, where she's buried? Um, uh, what I spent... Uh, four months a year in Berlin, and I took it upon me to visit her uh, resting uh, place. Um, and I, it's a, it's a, uh, her mother is also uh, buried there. I went there, and uh, now I had to find uh, her gravesite, and I asked four or five little old ladies, uh, where is Marlene Dietrich's uh, uh, grave? Nobody knew. <laughs> Finally, I found a young guy of 35 and said, ah, you, you should go in that direction. And sure enough, uh, that's where I found it. Uh, we have talked about the creative arts, but uh, uh, Berlin was also the world capital of uh, chemistry, uh, physics, uh, uh, biology. Uh, these are uh, some of the um, uh, Nobel Prize winners during the Weimar Republic uh, that mostly came from uh, Berlin. And uh, mind you, when we talk about Weimar Republic, I would say 80 to 90 percent of what we mean is what happened in Berlin and not in the rest of uh, Germany. So, uh, the final uh, five years, the demise, the collapse uh, of the Weimar Republic. Uh, here is uh, unemployment data, and you had unemployment of 30%. Uh, the Wall Street crash led to a worldwide depression. Germany suffered more than any other nation as a result of the recall of US loans by the banks who had lent them five years earlier. That exacerbated uh, uh, the situation in Germany. 
uh, and uh, it ultimately would lead to the destruction of German democracy. Uh, here is uh, hundreds, thousands uh, of unemployed uh, in Berlin. Uh, I'll go quickly uh, about um, Hitler, but that should be, Hitler is not the topic here, but uh, I'll give you a little chronology. Hitler was born in Braunau, Austria in, in 1889, serves uh, in World War I in the German army, even though he was not a German citizen. Uh, he moves to Munich and joins uh, the Workers' Party, becomes uh, leader of the Nazi Party, goes on trial for treason, uh, is sentenced uh, to five years, of which he served only nine months, during which he wrote his famous book, uh, or infamous book, Mein Kampf. In 1932, he still was an uh, Austrian uh, citizen, and in order to uh, be elected to uh, become chancellor, he had to become German citizen to run for office, even. It is still not clear today how uh, he was able to um, uh, become a German citizen. But anyway, uh, he wins the presidency and begins to dismantle the Weimar Republic. And infamously again, he becomes Times Man of the Year uh, in uh, 1938. Here is something that you need uh, to uh, uh, visualize and memorize. What I have done, this is my own research, I have um, tabulated uh, the election results of the parties in blue that were pro-republic, pro-democracy. And this is 1919, and this is, uh, so it, it covers the entire period of the Weimar Republic, and you see it. You had uh, four-fifths of uh, the population voted for Republican government, and these are the anti-Republican parties. Uh, and it goes uh, like this, from less than 20 to about two-thirds. And very critical uh, is uh, uh, Black Friday here. Uh, and you see that at the at 1930, with the Great Depression, um, uh, the non-Republican parties gain the majority. So that is the story uh, pretty much of uh, the uh, uh, blue uh, parties that I aggregated into one line are the SPD, the Social Democrats, the center, and uh, uh, right of center, but still a uh, Republican. And uh, the far left and the far right uh, are the non-democratic uh, parties. There were 15 governments, administrations in 14 years. Uh, the different colors uh, denote uh, who, uh, which party led uh, the, uh, what many people do not know is that Germany uh, uh, evidenced a brain drain during the Weimar Republic and later in the Third Reich. This is a lit, uh, from a book published in 1936 uh, there are hundreds, literally hundreds, and this is only archaeology, art history, uh, biology, chemistry, hundreds and thousands of people who left uh, uh, Germany to uh, other countries, uh, quite a few to um, these shores. The list goes on and on. Here is um, one of those who uh, left, and maybe some of you have heard his name, Fritz uh, Stern, born in uh, Berlin, emigrated in uh, 1938 at age 12, became a famous historian, uh, and he summarized uh, uh, the Weimar Republic uh, thus. Born in defeat, humiliated by Versailles, mocked and violated by its irreconcilable enemies at home, the Weimar Republic never gained the uh, popular acceptance which al alone would, uh, could have given its parliamentary, parliamentary system permanence, even in crisis. I have just uh, decided to add one thing, because I think it's a very apt uh, summary, but uh, in, in my uh, uh, summary it reads, 
uh, its economy brought to its knees by hyperinflation and Great Depression. Other than that, I have left it um, left it at this. Uh, if you want to know uh, what uh, uh, NSDAP stands for, we can discuss that uh, some other time. So uh, I timed it just about right, 50 minutes. So we have time for question and answer. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful. That's 
why uh, the party is called the National Socialist German Workers' Party. And uh, that what you mentioned is correct. Um, uh, the, the, what we call the right wing, the Nazis, they were national socialists, and you had uh, on the left the socialists and the communists, and they were together against individualist, liberal, capitalist society. That is uh, not seen today, but you are absolutely right. Uh, that was uh, uh, the only difference is they did not want to expropriate uh, the capitalists they wanted, but they wanted to control and direct them. That is correct. Um, Peter, uh, thank you for just an excellent uh, presentation and uh, rundown on the whole of Weimar Republic and whatnot. Okay, a, a couple of questions here, but. Uh, one was, um, what if the U.S. had not entered World War I at all? You know, they were basically at a stalemate, at a stalemate in 1917. And in 1918, Germany did win almost all the battles. Let me address this very quickly. I don't want to speculate on that one. Okay. Uh, I don't know what would have happened. And I'm sure some filmmaker has addressed that. Uh, al alternate history. I don't know. I don't want to speculate on that. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, kind of, uh, then I wouldn't have a topic here to talk about. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> what if Will, Kaiser Wilhelm had not been uh, forced to advocate and stayed in there like we kept the hero hand of uh, in power at, at the uh, end of World War II, and you know, he was actually a stabilizing force uh, in you know controlling Japan. But these reparations, that these reparations in the, in the 1920s were were devastating, and uh, you know we did not certainly require anything close and anything like that at all after World War II. You know, the, to uh, force these upon a defeated nation and one that was bankrupt was, was you know, catastrophic. Uh, can you comment on that? I think you are uh, right. Uh, and that's why I uh, uh, called my talk uh, Creation, Crises, and Collapse. And um, it, the Weimar Republic had a terribly hard start. The creation of the Republic was as difficult as it could have been. And the uh, uh, Treaty of Versailles made it uh, especially difficult. Okay. Uh, Bismarck, Bismarck, 1871, demanded huge no, uh, reparations Ovid, from... Ovid, Ovid wants me to talk uh, about the period uh, previous to the Weimar Republic, uh, that Second German Reich, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm, and especially Bismarck, uh, that is for the next uh, topic. Uh, I will tell you, I will tell you that uh, neither of the two, especially Bismarck, who was brilliant, but who was uh, uh, of a character that it, I would never uh, have been his friend, and he would not have been my friend. <laughs> okay. Deep, Deep Mar, in the in the middle period that you define as you know the Roaring Twenties, when uh, things seem to be going uh, pretty well in Berlin, you, you you talked about stability. Does that mean the inflation was under control during that period? The inflation ended uh, in December of uh, uh, 1923. That's when they had a currency reform and uh, brought in a new... Basically, they cut 15 or 18 zeros uh, from uh, the currency and called it... Okay, so we can't, we can't blame the inflation for the rise of Hitler. Right? Well, uh, in, uh, indirectly, yes, because the result of the inflation was that the middle class, which by and large was supportive of rep rep uh, Republican government, was wiped out. And there were misgivings, and they blamed uh, the politicians on it. And 
there was uh, a lot of resentment as a result of the hyperinflation. But, but it was the depression that really... It's the, uh, the, the, the dual crisis. The, the crisis in the first five years, uh, uh, punctuated by hyperinflation, and then uh, the Great Depression in uh, 1929. In the middle period, uh, I call it relative stability, the five years, and uh, the roaring 20s. One should call that the absence of crises. That's what it is. Yes. Uh, the Treaty of Versailles, you showed that it, it deals with uh, Germany. Uh, but the, in Versailles, they also dealt with the Allies, such as Hungary. And the Hungarians decry the Treaty of the Trianon. Trianon, of course, is one of the buildings in Versailles. And I was under the impression it was all one big deal. Are these two different treaties? No, it's just one treaty and uh, 14 uh, paragraphs deal with the creation of the League of Nations, the uh, precursor to the United Nations, and uh, 400 plus uh, uh, dealt with Germany. Uh, did Mark, I'm, yeah. I'm, I was struck by the fact of hyperinflation and printing of money, which is exactly what we're going through now. Would you please talk, make a comment on that? I, I have gone as far as I am allowed to talk about it. I am an economist by training, not an historian. I would love to talk about it, and, uh, uh, but I don't think that is, uh, should be the topic today. One question here. Yes, would you please clarify the election of Hitler? I understood that Hitler was not ever elected. Yes, he, he was, uh, his party, uh, no government uh, could be uh, created without his uh, leading party. The party had uh, won the most uh, votes. It was going to be a coalition or of some sort, but under the leadership of the NSDAP. And <coughs> he was, some people are convinced Hindenburg, uh, to appoint him uh, to become uh, chancellor. There was, uh, there's also speculation, was there, could there have been an alternative coalition, an alternative path, but it's moved uh, in, uh, on January 30th of 1933, he was appointed chancellor, and that was, in effect, the end of uh, the Weimar Republic. What uh, if you ask for uh, why did it happen? Well, Germany's uh, first constitution gave uh, vast emergency powers to the president. And uh, a president with these emergency powers was able to rule against or without the parliament. And he was able to appoint head of, of government, uh, and that's what, what's happened. That's why Germany's uh, constitution today gives the German president vastly fewer powers. Uh, that uh, the German president uh, is mostly ceremonial today. He does not have, well, we have learned the lessons of the Weimar Republic and the constitution. Uh, and that's uh, why the U.S. president has vastly more powers than the German president. In Germany, the chancellor uh, is uh, uh, the chief executive. Yeah, uh, President Woodrow Wilson's appearance in Versailles, the first president, as, as some of you may know, to travel outside of the U.S. to Europe, uh, caused a great stir and a lot of appreciation from Europeans, and I'm sure Germans, that he would you know, do the right thing. But the comment of Versailles, as Wilson arrived, that the uh, Allies were going to squeeze Germany until the pips squeaked like an orange. Um, what, can you give your opinion on that? How did that influence? Well, uh, the Allies were not allied in this. Uh, it was France, basically, that wanted Germany dismantled. 
that it never could rise again. Uh, uh, Great Britain and the U.S. Uh, were uh, steering against that, and uh, but uh, France basically um, had its way, uh, and you could see a few years later when Germany fell behind in the reparations, they invaded the uh, 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 western part of Germany. But it was basically France. Yes, uh, what percentage of the uh, 132 billion uh, hard marks of reparations that uh, Germany pay at the very end? I can give you an exact number. What I can tell you is that uh, after uh, the hyperinflation period, uh, and, uh, the reparations were stretched uh, over the years. Uh, I don't know exactly when the last uh, uh, of the 130 billion were paid, but sometimes in the 1960s, maybe 1970s. So it's all paid off by now, uh, but it took uh, decades to pay it off. Any other questions? One more. Thank you. Agnes, in German, please. Uh, <laughs> well, then they wouldn't understand us. <laughs> uh, 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 Agnes. Agnes is one uh, of several members of the German conversation group uh, who are in here uh, today. And thank you for coming. Yes. You're welcome. Dima, that was an incredible presentation. Okay. And I have a, actually a comment. Growing up in Germany, I remember my maternal grandfather who was wounded in World War I, when I was small, told me that they had so much paper money, they had to put it in a wheelbarrow. They couldn't carry it, so they could go buy a loaf of bread, and it never really, I never really thought about it until your presentation. I yeah, what, what happened is uh, that uh, uh, workers in the factories uh, got paid at the mo in the morning and went out and had their wives or other relatives come and take the money and rush to the store before they raise the prices again. Exactly. It's true. It's true. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Good morning. Thank you.